Welcome back. Sorry. Uh, the next hour and a half, several speakers from all over the world will give us more insights to one of our main themes, access to the basics. And if you have any questions for these speakers, you can uh, Twitter them and using, by using the hashtag WCDC. And no, this is not intellectual laziness from the host, but this is a service to you. So um, please use it. Our first speaker, Frank Cheptekema, is Frank Cheptekema. This industrial designer is turning his attention more and more towards sustainability and towards agriculture. Um, his ongoing research has led him to the design of self-sustaining farms that come ideally landmarked on top of existing buildings. Please welcome Frank Cheptekema. <laughs> Um, I'd like to start my presentation by uh, talking about what uh, design has done to, uh, to our countryside in Holland. Uh, in uh, specifically this area, uh, Almere. Um, what you see on this slide is actually uh, totally designed. Everything here is man-made. There's absolutely nothing natural about what you are seeing on this image. Um, and as you zoom in, uh, we've seen some architectural examples this morning uh, from Jacob. Uh, of a sort of hyper uh, uh, functionalism uh, when it comes to housing and when people get the chance to uh, make any every design decisions often you get these sort of uh, uh, very rational environments uh, and a forest next to this neighborhood would look like this every tree is uh, is uh, planted in a sort of arithmetical uh, pattern um, and but when I, when I travel, I often uh, come in uh, uh, places where I see this sort of architecture. And uh, this helps me, images like this, uh, juxtaposed to images from Holland, uh, help me to position myself uh, as a designer. Actually, exactly at the borderline of these two images, on the right hand, you have uh, something which is totally improvised, uh, totally, um, um, yeah, uh, improvised, uh, intuitive, uh, and on the left you have something very engineered, very uh, well thought through, but lacking uh, a lot of emotion, lacking uh, humanity. Uh, in both these images I have nothing to do as a designer. Uh, I'm not needed on the right, I'm not needed on the left. Uh, it is really on the border of these images that uh, I, can, I can mean something. Um, so what design can do, uh, I'd like to uh, split my presentation in two halves, ten minutes about what design can do to itself, I think, uh, and the second half of the presentation about what design can do to uh, farming, because uh, I was asked specifically to, to, to talk about one project I'm working on. Um, let me see. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I did the wrong button. Yes. First of all, I think uh, design should be more open. Uh, I was uh, taught in the 90s uh, from uh, teachers that were themselves at, uh, taught in the halfway last century. So uh, I have a heavy uh, uh, Bauhaus background, modernistic background. And I think what uh, design has done in the last 10, 20 years is liberate itself from any dogmatic approach uh, which is totally obsolete right now to be dogmatic about design. Uh, thanks to new media, thanks to the digitalization, uh, machines make everything possible now. Whereas uh, in the last century we were very limited by what machines could do. Uh, they di dictated a simplistic uh, aesthetic. Now machines can do anything. So if we want to go back to Baroque, we can do it. Um, we can do anything with machines. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of new values that are coming into design that are very interesting. Uh, open design is one of them. I don't know if this thing is working. Yes. Uh, this is a vase I designed in 2003. And uh, here we explored uh, to which extent can the end user influence the shape of a product. Uh, in this product you actually give us your, a signature and we transform it into a vase. Um, which means that the designer is not directly influencing the, the shape itself, it's actually designing a process. 
Um, the shape of the design is, uh, is very personal. It's actually uh, dependent on uh, your total individual signature, so it's very different for everybody. It's like a digital uh, print. Um, and it's also a pr product without a brand because your name becomes the brand of the, of the product. Next image, please. Um, design should accept the user. Uh, we've seen that uh, a lot of design is uh, very sterile. Uh, it doesn't accept traces of usage. Uh, it doesn't, definitely doesn't accept uh, it to be broken. Um, next image, please. So I was interested in uh, uh, seeing... I don't know. Should, can I get another uh, one of these, please? It's... Uh, Shall I, shall I push a button somewhere? I don't know. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> so the do break uh, is uh, the first vase in the history of vases that was specially designed to be broken. Uh, when you buy the vase, it's a perfectly uh, normal, anonymous uh, shape of a vase, a generic shape. Next image, please. Um, but when you, uh, when you are uh, into a fight, uh, a quarrel with your partner, uh, you can throw the vase at each other and it will keep the traces of, uh, of the, these events because it breaks but it doesn't fall apart. Next image, please. So it's like an eggshell, for example. Next image, please. <laughs> it's working again? This is for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go a step, step further. Can we make design to be shockproof, to uh, uh, be resist resistant to very extreme uh, events? Um, and I'd like to show you a little movie about the process of making these vases. Uh, yeah, we're long gone from the time that the designer was somebody with a pencil and a, a white piece of paper. Uh, you can actually use any means to create a design, and I would like to show you this little movie about how I created the shockproof collection. So in this collection, we actually t took uh, vases from famous designers. One of these is sitting right here, Mr. Drawer. Uh, and we uh, actually made them shockproof and uh, applied uh, a very extreme events to them, uh, creating these, this sort of uh, collection of vases that looks antique, but it is uh, new at the same time. Um, layeredness is something that I find very interesting. Um, yeah. Products t tend to be uh, clean, something uh, Marcel Van has called the baby face uh, fixation, uh, that we want things to look pure. Uh, um, in the previous presentation, we heard that actually uh, parts of animals are thrown away because they, they, they have little traces of, uh, of, of, of uh, 
of the, the animal itself, its life. Um, this is a lamp I designed where I sort of explored if, if destruction during the process of making could, be, could lead to a sort of interesting image. So we use a laser machine to apply a decoration to, to the, this product. Um, and we went and looked how far can we go before the, 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 the object actually disintegrates. And is it adding value to the project or is it uh, destroying it? Uh, and it's just an interesting uh, thought exercise. Um, get real. Uh, I design a, a, a lot of jewelry, um, and the jewelry world is, uh, is is really an extreme example of a world where uh, design tries to create an illusion, uh, an illusion of, uh, of endless happiness, of uh, beauty, of uh, uh, love being forever, ever. And we all know that uh, hearts get broken. Uh, so I dis designed this piece, uh, where actually you get a piece of jewelry, you also get a ritual. Uh, and it's not only about the, the, the moment of declaration of love, it's also uh, the, possibi the possibility of ending uh, a relationship, which is included in the, in the design. Be critical. Um, we've had uh, the branding hype. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's been the last 15 years. Uh, um, I was interested in making the most branded object in the world, uh, and by, by thus also uh, um, pointing out maybe the end of branding. Because uh, if you buy this object, actually you don't need to care about brands anymore in your life. You've got them all in, uh, in one object, one piece uh, of jewelry. Um, so if this is the new religion, branding, uh, what do the what does the new church look like? So I designed this, uh, this proposal for a shopping mall, which includes all the big brand names. Uh, and it also shows how city centers, it's actually a, a metaphor for what's already happening in cities. Uh, the city centers are heavily branded, are the most exciting parts of the city, uh, while the suburbs get boring, monotonous. Design can reward people. Uh, this is a piece uh, I, desi I designed when my daughter was born. Um, instead of telling the family that uh, there was going to be a new child, we decided to design something and to give it to everybody. Uh, so we made these medals, uh, and we gave them to everybody, including my, my daughter, who was uh, rewarded to be, have become a baby. Uh, my grandfather was rewarded to have become a grandfather my father. Uh, we have a great-grandmother. Um, design can also complicate things uh, in a good way. Uh, I think the complicated things are, are often more interesting than very simple things. But there's this dogma of simplicity uh, that has been uh, yeah, on, on the, up on design for some reason. Uh, so I try to explore comple complexity in the, in, in the pieces I make. Uh, make them as, as complex as, as possible instead of making them as simple as possible. Be nostalgic. It was also not allowed to be uh, nostalgic for a long time in, in design land. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the oldest project I'm showing today. Uh, this was, I did this as a student. Uh, we were asked to uh, make a drilling machine. And I proposed uh, not a drilling machine that looks like uh, a laser gun, but a drilling machine that looks like uh, something from, uh, from the past, like a windmill, for example. Oh, this was uh, the result of the project. Be thin or be fat. Uh, Design wants to be thin, wants to be uh, intelligent, simple, um, but we as humans are often not all of those qualities. Uh, we, uh, obesity is a big problem in society. Uh, I think, the, why, why don't the objects in, in, that surround us uh, reflect that? Why can we not uh, propose a design based on obesity instead of thinness? Um, so these are projects really uh, um, that we, we make in, in our lab, uh, let's say, context. We, we just try to question uh, society through design. Challenge the status quo. Uh, when you go to Milano, in, uh, you see hundreds of sofas that all uh, look the same, or at least they're based on the status quo of what a sofa should be. 
uh, we propose this in Milan, uh, a sort of uh, very ancient form of, of uh, furniture. It's a bird's nest. It's maybe the f first sort of furniture uh, I know of in, uh, in nature. Uh, we had a slight transportation problem. Um, this design can uh, uh, also intrigue. Uh, we were asked to design the, the airco system of, uh, of this space uh, at Heathrow Airport. And um, um, yeah, it was interesting to take something that is usually in architecture hidden behind the walls, the air conditioning system, and actually um, trying to make a sculpture out of that piece. Uh, so we, we use the metaphor of a tree. Uh, the tree uh, provides us with uh, oxygen, uh, like the air uh, would provide us with air in this space. Um, so we took real tree branches, but manipula manipulated them with, uh, with computer, uh, and it created this, this sort of uh, intriguing uh, tree-like shape. And there are different metaphors, and it also looks like a, a stack of plates, of broken plates. <coughs> which is relevant because it's, it's a restaurant. So now I go to the second part of my presentation. What can uh, design do for agriculture? Um, and the starting point of this project is uh, a project from the 70s, uh, the biosphere. Uh, I can actually remember uh, as a little boy, I must have been uh, 10, uh, hearing about this project. And I, I was totally fascinated that uh, seven people were going to be uh, put into space without being able to, to get out for seven months, I think. Um, and uh, uh, it was a total failure, this project. It was, uh, it was financed by a, a rich uh, Texan. Uh, and his, ideal was, his idea behind the project was uh, someday we're going to colonize Mars. Not because of, uh, just like, because of, he, he had seen too much science fiction films, seriously. It was, was not any other sort of ambition behind it, behind, except let's colonize other planets. Uh, but it was very visionary uh, in some way. Um, but it was a failure. Technically, it, it, everything went wrong with the project uh, uh, because they were actually too much in advance. Uh, it, it was too early for the days, this project. Um, if they had put some cameras inside, they would have invented the, the television program Big Brother, and it would have at least been a, a huge uh, financial s uh, success. Uh, these are the people who went in. This was uh, the situation, a sort of uh, closed ecosystem uh, in which nothing goes in or out. Um, and I think there's a parallel be between this first project 30 years ago and the new projects we see, uh, which are about urban farming, about uh, um, yeah, um, uh, linking processes within closed systems. So this is a proposal for a, a mega farm in, in the in the harbor of Rotterdam. Uh, very intelligent systems are used here to, to link uh, different sort of uh, uh, processes. For example, the heat of the animals is used uh, to, uh, to uh, heat the, the greenhouses. The CO2 is recycled through the greenhouses. Um, uh, but there's a, a big emotional barrier to implement these projects. Uh, this is a, a housing project uh, uh, near Utrecht, where actually uh, houses are linked to greenhouses. Um, and also you can have all these processes that are linked. Uh, a greenhouse can uh, generate uh, the clean drinking water. Uh, it can... Uh, the, the biological... Uh, the, the bio... Um, every, everything that's biological is uh, recycled through the greenhouse. Uh, it, it actually works as a sort of power battery. Um, and yeah, just besides the fact that these uh, sort of diagrams are fascinating, I thought it would be interesting to uh, visit uh, these concepts, but from a, uh, from a cultural standpoint, and uh, see what we can do with the idea of self-sufficiency. Um, so I, uh, we started calculating what, what do you need to have to sustain one person, just to keep one person alive. Uh, and we started calculating how much food you needed. We looked into uh, uh, diagrams from uh, farm, farming uh, plants, uh, and we came up with this diagram. You need 210 square meters to sustain one person. 
Um, and we thought, as a sort of iconic project, it would be beautiful to make this house uh, which sustains itself and in which one inhabitant uh, doesn't need to leave the house. It can just stay there. Uh, he doesn't have to go to the grocery shop. Uh, he doesn't have to plug his house into an electricity plant. Uh, everything is, uh, uh, is recycled as well as possible. And actually what you have created is sort of a mini biosphere, uh, uh, a sort of lunar module you could actually put anywhere in the city or anywhere in the landscape uh, and sustain one person. Uh, economically, a uh, project like this is total nonsense because it's a very, very expensive house. Uh, but I think as an icon, it would be very interesting to create a, an object like this, uh, just to see, to make visible what, what we are actually needing as one human being. Um, we did the same exercise with 100 people. There are three chapters to the project. The second chapter is 100 people. Uh, we started calculating what do you need. Uh, and basically, we came up with a, a diameter of 400 meters f to sustain 100 people. What do you have when you have 100 people? You have a, a nice, closed uh, community. Um, so, what happens if you put this uh, diagram into a, a landscape? Uh, you create a sort of a village, a self-sustainable village. Uh, and we started repeating this as a sort of a tile you would put in the, in the landscape. And uh, you create something that looks a lot like Almere. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a thought exercise. It's, it's can we actually recreate a, a totally new uh, society based on, uh, on a simple idea, a self-sustaining uh, community of 100 people. And we made uh, some calculations. Uh, if this would work, theoretically it, it, it could work. Um, we could still, we are at 16 million people in Holland approximately right now. We could still grow to 25 million people. Uh, in, with a society where you don't need any more banks, you don't need any more uh, roads, uh, you don't need advertising agen uh, agencies, brands. Um, and it's really just... Uh, just a, a thought exercise, a theoretical thought exercise. Uh, how could this look, a society like this? Um, then the last chapter, self-sufficient but fun. Uh, we looked at what do you need to self-sustain a thousand people. Uh, and we thought, well, for a thousand people a day, it would be nice to uh, create a, an amusement park and uh, link two extremes. Uh, the, ex the extreme of fun, uh, leisure, uh, something that is obviously not necessary or imp important for society, maybe for people personally, uh, but taking one extreme and combining it to something extremely useful, which is uh, ger generating food um, in a, in a self-sufficient manner. So these are first sketches. We calculated what, you, what do you need for uh, for a thousand people a day. We came with a certain amount of chickens, a certain amount of uh, pigs, uh, cows, people up there, and we proposed uh, this uh, this object. Um, I'd like to show you a little movie, a one-minute movie, of what this could look like.
So that was my presentation. Thank you. Yes. From Chip Kamal. Yeah. I'd like to start with a question from Twitter from Hans van der Lucht. Mm -hmm. Where are the farmers and their wishes in uh, these pro uh, proposals? Um, yeah, that's 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 a good question. This is. Uh, uh, as I said before, it's it's really a thought exercise, and uh, uh, we try to to look at uh, a domain that is usually exclusively to uh, not even not not so much to farmers, but to to engineers. I think the engineers are taking over the subject, so it's it's a very good question. Where are the farmers in this story? Uh, I haven't addressed that in this project. Uh, I've more looked into. Uh, what can you add as a designer in the discussion between uh, the engineers and society? Um, but yeah. uh, when you see the, 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 the both halves of your presentation, the first half is very about what design can be, mm -hmm. and the second half is about what design can do. But is the approach really different, fundamental different from the first half, like what design can be, or is this more uh, like a cultural approach? Yeah, I guess it's it's uh, it's. Uh, um, it's, it's trying to question things, and uh, uh, I guess everything uh, that I do is is, fr is motivated personally by uh, questioning w why are vases uh, as they are, why 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 is it not allowed to break a vase, uh, why are uh, theme parks uh, always stupid things you go to and that mm -hmm. that, that are not really necessary, uh, and then just trying to combine extremes like I combine the breaking a vase with a vase, I combine a theme park with a, with a farm. So uh, I find that very interesting to see how extremes can influence each other. But then do you really think that that, that design can do something to, 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 to really activate something, to make the world better, to solve problems? Because um, it's more like the researching the question than to answer Yeah, it. I think... I think uh, Design can sort of analyze the cultural impact of what technology is doing. It can sort of try to guide it. Um, but in the end, I think the, the problems that are created by technology will be solved by technology. And mm -hmm. design is just there to, as a sort of buffer between society and, and, and technology, I think. It's not, it's not so much that the designer will save the world. I, I don't believe that. You don't believe that. <laughs> so, what do you believe? <laughs> Um, wow, <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> well, but you, I mean, you, you've done research for years for this, I yeah. mean, it, 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 and, and I mean, you, you, it, it takes a lot of time. And yeah. so there comes a point that you think well, this I, has I, to become reality or what? Yeah, well, well uh, I, I, this project has absolutely uh, generated uh, very, very uh, tangible things for our studio. Uh, for example, we, are, we, are, we have just delivered uh, uh, in Schiphol Airport a complete area uh, that we redesigned, which is very uh, reminiscent from what we did in this exercise, mm -hmm. but, but more on an aesthetical level, because of course we are not farming in Schiphol. Yeah. Uh, but the aesthetics are very much uh, part of the world that I just sh uh, shown here. Okay. And don't you think that innovation in the end is also a crossover between different disciplines? Because definitely, yeah. Definitely. definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's why uh, I was uh, did a, uh, trained as product designer. Uh, I live in society, I see a lot of buildings, and uh, I have the urge to, to create uh, structures that are not products. Uh, it's a, it's a personal uh, engagement, uh, and I don't care about people saying you're not an architect. Uh, that doesn't really interest me at all. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank Frank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.